So, you want to install a heat pump on your own DIY. Well, you've come to the right video. So this is going to be explaining the installation of a Mr. Cool two or three ton heat pump. And uh, we're going to be going over some, you know, terrible boneheaded mistakes that you want to avoid. Uh, we're also going to be covering, you know, how you can get these heat pumps practically for free. We're we'll also be covering the details of setting up the new electrical and the details of setting up uh, the inside coil. This is going to be an installation inside an existing uh, electric furnace. And I'm going to be showing you explaining all the mysteries of the thermostats and the wiring and explaining how the outside condenser and all the lines get installed. Okay, so let's first of all start with... Uh, ordering this so uh, this particular unit is uh, two slash three and that means that this can run at either two ton or three ton at the flip of a switch so that's what that means i didn't first i really didn't understand what that actually meant uh you know but uh when i ordered it i found that the prices were pretty much the same so I ordered it from a place called Ingram uh, Air and Water. And uh, one mistake I made was that I actually ordered the wrong thing. You want to make sure you're ordering a heat pump and not an air conditioning package. So when I had gotten this whole thing delivered and it comes in a big pallet, uh, I had moved it over and got it installed. But when I opened it up, I found out it didn't have the connections for a heat pump. It was just an air conditioner. So uh, yeah, that was a huge mistake. And I had to send it back. And uh, uh, Ingram was very gracious about accepting the returns uh, without uh, huge restocking fees. It cost me $275 uh, to return that. Uh, but I was lucky that it was only the 275 they could have charged me a lot for restocking fees. So a shout out to Ingrams for uh, their excellent customer service. Uh, the other mistake I made was that when I measured out the size of the uh, hoses, I figured that uh, 15 feet would be practically perfect. Except that when I got the heat pump, I was assuming that it would attach in the back. But instead, it actually attached in the front, which meant that I needed another extra two or three feet. And so I also had to return the 15-foot uh, hose and get a 25-foot hose instead. Now, the Mr. Cool is, is self-installed, and everything is pre-charged. So these, uh, these lines are of a fixed size. So it's either 15 feet or 25 feet, nothing in between. So uh, make sure that when you figure out how much hose you need to make sure that you get more than enough. So don't make the boneheaded mistake that you ordered the wrong thing and you ordered uh, too short a hose. Um, I also made the same mistake when I was ordering thermostat wiring in that uh, I thought I added an extra two or three feet onto what was I was measuring but it turned out it was just barely enough. If I stretched the wire as much as I could, I could just barely get it to run to where I got it. Okay, so those are the first mistakes you want to avoid. So um, now I do have this thing about getting this practically free. Now, if you're trying to install a, uh, get a, a heat pump installed, you know, it. I got a quote for like $17,000, okay? And that's a huge amount of money. Uh, but uh, if you buy the Mr. Cool, the equipment itself only runs about maybe $3,600, which is far sh less than $17,000. And uh, like around here, you can get a rebate from the local um, electrical company for uh, up to $2,400. So that would cover all but a, like $1,000 though. But you can also get for 2023, a 30% uh, 
federal tax credit, and that will help cover even more of that cost. So if you do it yourself, it could be practically free. So the first thing we're going to cover is the electrical. So uh, the electrical alone on a project like this would run about $2,000. So let's go see what has to be done. So we're going to walk over here. I've got my electrical panel open. So uh, you need to add a new breaker. Now the thing is that you have to find exactly the same kind of breaker that your panel already has. So I found this exact same kind of brand and breaker from Home Depot, so that wasn't a problem. So you just, uh, it's very easy to just snap these in here and then you have a new breaker. So the harder part is uh, figuring out how to run the wires. Now, if you're gonna do anything electrical, you don't wanna do anything like this if you're not comfortable and you don't know what you're doing. So please don't anyone try this unless you know what you're doing, okay? And uh, one of my tips is, is that you really want to always know whether you're dealing with live circuits or not. And, uh, you know, you have this uh, non-invasive probe here, which will tell you whether your lines are active, right? So always use something like this so that you know whether something is actually working or not. Okay, so that's tip number one. So the easy part of getting the breaker, the harder part is getting this run this line all the way to uh, where your heat pump is. And uh, the requirements in, uh, in my city are that you have to run a hard uh, metallic conduit all the way to uh, the, uh, the box that's on the outside. So you can see here that, you know, I've got, I, I, I've knocked out a hole here and I'm running my wires into there. Now the trick is, is getting this, this is a solid metal pipe. It's about five feet long up here and uh you can't do that because there's not enough room in the crawl space to actually do it so the way i did it was i actually cut the pipe in half and then i stuck the first half of it up and then i connected up the second half and i shoved the other half up but then you get this problem of well how do i because this has to be connected with uh this nut here right so you have to thread this pipe into that hole and that's virtually impossible you know I, so what i did is that and, and i did all of this on my own so i didn't have any helpers so what i did is i cut out this little section here of drywall so that when i shoved the pipe in there then i could see where it, where it was fish it out and then um shove it through the little hole and apply the nut so that is your hint on how to get that to work um, the other thing is, is that we have this, uh, this is like a number 10 wire and you can only use separate wires in conduit. You can't run, so that's why I'm not running Romex here because it needed to be all, uh, metal conduit. And it's, it's this is actually fairly stiff wire. And, uh, the one trick I learned is that after you get it home from Home Depot, it's all in a big loop. And what you have to do is you have to actually straighten it out right you gotta unloop unloop it make it completely straight because if you try and pull this wire while it's in the coil it's just gonna it's just gonna knot up so that's the first thing you need to do is just straighten it all out another thing is is that you know i use the cheapest conduit which is like you know half inch conduit uh but i i would go because this stuff is so stiff um i would go with like you know bigger conduit than the half inch, you know, go, go to, go to at least three quarters, right? Uh, it, it'll make it a lot easier to pull the wires. I have to pull the wires around like things like corners and, uh, a, a little bit more space would have been helpful. Okay. So that is the main in-house electrical here. So let's take a look at the installation of the inside coil here. So what I've got here is this is an, an existing, electric furnace it's a 51,000 BTU electric furnace and basically this entire area here was empty now this has been designed to take an air conditioning coil um, but I had to buy there's this there is this shelf so there is a shelf I bought for $133 it's designed for this cabinet you screw this in here 
and then you can put the coil on top here. So this is what I've got here. Now, when they sell you the coil, it's actually in its own box. You know, they call it cased. And so uh, first thing I had to do is I had to unscrew the whole thing and just take the coil out. And so uh, this is the uncased version. And then uh, you know, I have to use a lot of uh, aluminum tape here to seal it. So I seal it from the bottom there and any openings here. Now the real trick though that Noah will explain to you is just how difficult it is to run these lines in here, okay? And it's very difficult uh, because you, you can see how thick this line is. It's like a three quarter inch line. It's huge. It takes a fair amount of force to bend. Now they do have these, these uh, spring coils in here. Now the, that is to help you when you bend it, make it so that you don't collapse the tube. So one problem I had is that after I managed to pull this line into the cabinet here, it kind of pushed the springs down, so like the springs stop here. But what I really needed is to have the springs here, since I was kind of in danger of collapsing this line without them. So if you do this, you know, I don't maybe want to tape the tape these springs um, onto here so that it doesn't slide, because the problem is is that you can see this this is a downflow uh, furnace and the flow straight down which means the duct that carries the air is right below here which means you can't run these lines straight down because there's an air duct right there so what happens is that this has to go down it has to make a fairly sharp turn to the right and then go down because it has to go over the duct and uh, yeah that makes pulling these lines extremely difficult and uh, 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 as a single person I had to kind of like shove it a little bit from the bottom and then come back up and pull it a little bit from the top and then go back down and shove it from the bottom so uh, two persons would have definitely helped out in this situation here but yeah it's extremely difficult and extremely difficult to bend this thing in the right angle it's a fairly sharp bend but uh yeah that is one of the difficulties i can't quite explain how hard that was to do uh, another thing is that you have the drain here so in operation this fills with water and then um so that i have a pipe here and uh, the code requirement is that there actually has to be a p-trap in here so this plastic pipe actually goes up and goes down and then it exits the building. Uh, but that's how I decided I would solve this particular problem. Depending on what kind of situation you have, you may have to come up with something different. Now, I wanted to show you the connections uh, that Mr. Cool uses that makes it possible for this to be a completely do-it-yourself operation. So what we have here is that we have the hose and there's a big nut here that connects it. And then there is a, uh, an adapter here. And so you have to take this adapter and you have to screw it on to this end here. And underneath this cap is a valve which uh, releases the gases, okay? Now, the trick is, is that these have to be carefully tightened in order to prevent the escape of gas. You know, one of the mistakes that I've seen in other videos is that you know they would tighten it with just like a wrench they say and but it would leak okay so when it leaks it'll all leak out and then you're gonna have to call an hv tech to come and recharge the system and that's gonna cost you like 700 bucks so uh, to prevent that i wanted to make sure that i was correctly torquing these things on now the difficulty though is is that regular torque wrenches you know, like this, uh, will not work on nuts like that. So uh, what I decided to do as I got what this is what is known as a claw foot wrench here, right? So what you need to do is you need to get a claw foot wrench and you need to put it at a 90 degree angle like that. And then you can, then you can uh, use it, right? You cannot use it 
straight like this. It just doesn't work. You have to be at 90 degrees. And you can go see some other videos. You want to figure out why that is. So, but the problem is, is that, you know, if, if for example, you got to first tighten this thing on, is that you have to get this torque wrench on. Like that, right? But because this thing is kind of wiggling around, you got to hold on to this other thing here. And then you got to get up to 50 foot pounds onto this to tighten it. And that's a lot, okay? You know, for, for example, the maximum deflection on this torque wrench is 50 pounds. So it's like the maximum you can put on a standard 3 8 inch uh, torque wrench. So if you're confident that you know what 50 foot pounds feels like, 30 to 50 foot pounds, well, you know, you can go for it. But otherwise, but also you want to make sure to soak these up good after you do that and make sure that there's no leaks. So I did soaping several times and ensured myself that there are no leaks here. Uh, now the <clears throat> The, the gas lines, after you get these tightened up, then you open the gas lines. This one is huge. I mean, you're going to need a big uh, hex, specialty hex wrench. No small hex wrench is going to be able to open this thing up. So just be aware. So, but in order to do all of this, you know, you'll need four of these claw wrenches. So I have one and three eighths. This is one and a quarter, a one inch, and a seven eighth. Now, Alternatively, uh, you can get an adjustable crescent wrench. I think I just saw one on Amazon, and those are about 150 bucks. Um, although that seems to be a lot of money for a tool that you're only going to use once. Although all these claw feet probably cost me about 40 bucks. So, but still, it's kind of a, a one-use thing. Okay, so we have covered um, the installation of the interior coil. Now, let's go and cover what's going on with the magical thermostats, okay? So uh, you have to use a specific heat pump thermostat with heat pumps, okay? So what the heck is different with the heat pump thermostat? Uh, well, the main thing is that it has an emergency heat setting. And if you put it on that, then your electrical furnace just returns back to its electrical furnace operation, which means it's only going to use electric resistance heat. Now, if you are on heat mode, then that will use the compressor uh, in, in order to get the heat pump heat, which is the less expensive heat. That's why you want to get a heat pump because it's much more efficient than the electric resistance heat. And then we have the cooling setting, and that will make it so that it cools, okay? So, but when you look at all these wires in here, you know, this, this is super confusing here. So what we have here in the heat pump is, for example, the green wire, and that just controls the fan. So the thermostat is really just a bunch of relays. You can just think of uh, a bunch of relays in here, and all you're doing is that you're connecting uh, the red wire, which is 24 volt power, to one of these other lines. It just literally took a red wire, green wire, shorted together, that would turn on the fan, which is what, say, this would do. When you turn it to the on position, it's just putting it's just connecting the red and the green wires together. Now for the heat pump, you have the yellow wire and that tells it to turn on the compressor. So that compressor will be on when it, whether you are heating or cooling. So that's why you have the yellow line. And then in order to tell a difference between heat and cool, you have this B terminal. And this determines whether it's doing either heat mode or cool mode, okay? So it'll be opposite, like this one is orange, it's powered when you are in heat mode. Uh, then we have a bunch of other confusing uh, connections, particularly uh, it's either gonna be the white or E, 
and auxiliary. So no one really explains to you what these things do, okay? So I'm the only one who's gonna explain what's the difference between these two terminals. Typically, they're shorted together. So what the W or E means is that this is the electric heat power. So if you are in emergency heat mode, it's gonna power that white wire. Okay, so that's just electrical heat wire. So that only comes into play when you're using emergency heat. So what on earth is auxiliary? Okay, what auxiliary is, is that say if you are in heat mode and uh, if you are like over a degree from the setting, like it's 69, but it's, I've set it at 70, you see there's a little plus one here. What that's telling you is that it's also calling for electrical resistance heat. So if they put it down, then you know that should turn that should basically turn off. And then you would only be using heat pump heat. So if if this is like this, the room is at 69 and you ask for 70, it's gonna send a signal out to the auxiliary, which is gonna call for the expensive electrical heat. Now here in Washington, I had to do this crazy thing where I want to lock this out unless the outside temperature is less than 32 degrees. So I had to take this auxiliary line, run it all the way to the outside to an external thermostat, which uh, only closes at less than 32 degrees, and then connect it up to the uh, defrost signal from the heat pump, okay? Now, defrost mode is also another mystery of the universe that no one will explain to you how that works. You know, the problem with uh, the heat pump is that as it operates, it starts to accumulate frost on the outside coil. It's unavoidable uh, to the point where it just doesn't work anymore because the, it completely blocks the air. And in order to combat that, the uh, heat pump has what is known as a defrost mode. So what it does is that it actually converts about from heat pump mode into air conditioning mode. And what that does is that that heats up the coils in the outside unit and melts the ice. Now, the thermostat has nothing to do with defrost mode, okay? It doesn't know what the outside temperature is. It doesn't know what, what's going on with the heat pump. Only the heat pump knows that its, uh, that its coils are all iced up and it needs to do something. So what it does is that it like reverses this valve here and turns your system into an air conditioner. Now the problem with turning your air condition, turning your system into an air conditioner when it's cold outside, is that it's going to blow ice cold air into your house, which would be really surprising. It's like it's you're 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 sitting there, and it's like there's ice cold air blowing out of the out of the registers. Uh, so to prevent that, the the defrost signal here is connected to the electrical heating. Re electrical resistance heat. So what it does is that when it's defrosting, it actually turns on the electrical resistance heat so that you don't feel a humongous blast of cold air uh, when it's doing its defrost thing. Okay, so that was the mysteries of how the heat pump thermostat works and how the defrost signal works. Once again, the thermostat does not know anything about how to do defrost. It is just going to ask for heat and uh, as soon as the heat pump recognizes that it can't do it, it's gonna turn on your electric resistance heat and then turn your heat pump into an air conditioner temporarily and it happens fairly quickly. So I mean I did like a time-lapse video. The only way I know my, my defrost system works is that I put a time-lapse camera on it and I could see it frost up and then all of a sudden it would clear out and it would frost up and then clear up. But that is how that works. Now, 
One problem I had here is that I did have to replace the wiring for the thermostat. You know, you need all these wires in order to get this to work. And one problem I had is, I don't know, somehow some of the wires got shorted out. And uh, I had to end up replacing this thing. And it's really hard to fish a new wire through, like, walls here. But, you know, this is what I did. So, I have this thing from Harbor Freight. It's a super long drill bit. So, what I did was that I removed the molding here and then I drilled straight down into the floor until this dropped into my crawl space. So that way I knew where that hole was exactly. And then I actually drilled uh, another hole like, you know, two inches away to get into the center of the stud and then fed the wire up. Of course, how can you get the wire fed up like you know nearly four and a half feet against gravity and uh, that's where I, I had just happened to have this flexible uh, fiberglass uh, pole and I shoved this thing up with the wire attached to it and uh, then I had to use a, a coat hanger to go catch this thing and pull it pull it down with the wire and then finally get the wire out so those are the tricks about rewiring your thermostat because you may have to run new uh, wiring. I mean, you need at least one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, seven, potentially seven uh, wires in order to get this done. Okay, so that is the thermostat. So the last thing we're going to do is we're going to check out uh, the installation of the condenser. Okay, so we're going to go outside and see how that was done. Now, of course, one of your major tasks is trying to figure out how to get, you know, this 200 pound box to where you need it here. So I would suggest a lot of men, but I didn't have any men, so I actually kind of built a path to get here. But here we have the condenser unit, and uh, some of the things I did is that instead of pouring a concrete pad, they do have this pre-made plastic pad, so I used that. So you just have to clear the ground and then put this on top. Um, I also drove some, uh, these are like 12-inch spikes into the ground here. Uh, I also wanted to raise this up a little bit more since this pad is not very thick. So I, I raised it up using these isolation pads here. So that's what I did. Now you can see for this unit that the, uh, that the lines, they run up to like the midway of the, of the unit here, right? I was kind of expecting them to end up back here, but they don't. And the typical installation, uh, the, the, the hoses are, are supposed to be run from the front or the side, which is super awkward. I mean, who would want to do that? That's terrible. Um, and it was a very tight fit to get. Once again, you have to bend these things uh, quite severely in order to get them in. Now, um, for, for my passing inspection, I had to do things like actually measure the pressure uh, that's that's in the running system. So now you can get a standard, you know, set of hoses for AC. But the problem with that is that when you're dealing with the liquid lines, is that you know those things fill up with liquid, and when you take them off, it's just like a huge amount of refrigerant escapes, and it's a big mess, and it's dangerous. Uh, so. I didn't want to do that, so instead I, I made up this little doohickey here. So you can buy this valve here. So this these have Schrader valves in it, which are just like the valves in your tires. So if you push them down, they open up. So this, this allows you to uh, attach it on there without opening it up. Then you screw this down, and then it, it opens it up. So that way the only, the, the only refrigerant is just in here to there, which is very little. Then I can measure the pressure. And uh, then when I disconnect, I can close it and then take it off and it's very little lost free on there. 
Now, I, I was talking about the uh, cutoff thermostat. So this is the cutoff thermostat I have in here. So that's set at 32 degrees, and uh, that will only, only open up when it's below 32 degrees. So this will not run even when the thermostat is asking for auxiliary heat unless it's less than 32 degrees out here. Okay, so let's take a look um, at the details of some of the electrical here. So hopefully you can see you've got electrical conduit here. And back here, we have the excess hose here. So like I said, there's a 25 foot hose and the extra has to go somewhere. So it's just looped around here and then comes through here. So the, that's one of the things you're going to have to figure out is where you're going to put the extra. And uh, like I said, these things are not easy to bend. All right. But I think that is going to do. Oh, the other thing I have installed here is a surge protective device here because uh, these this heat pump's got more computing power than a PC, I think, and a lot of sensitive electronics. So uh, this should hopefully make it so that this is protected against surges, and that has to be uh, wired in parallel uh, with your wires here. And you also have, always have to have this cutout box here so that you can disconnect your uh, unit from the outside. And I think that's just about everything. Uh, uh, sorry about the video being so long, but once again, this is the information that you really need to know if you're gonna try and tackle a project like this.